Good evening, my fellow Riz Elite members. This is Chris with Riz International, and this is your weekly market recap. I want to thank everybody for rolling with us as we decided to go ahead and take a bit of a long weekend last weekend going into the 4th of July holiday here in the United States. Uh, we It is Independence Day for us here, and thank you all for letting me have that with my family and, you know, time, uh, just a way, time to relax, rejuvenate, get everything going. But now we are back, so we've got a couple weeks to take a look at here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the S&P 500 as it stands right now. Now, obviously, we had a bit of a turn here towards the end of June, and then it has been nothing but green skies until we kind of got here to Thursday. Then the news dropped about the Delta variant, and everybody was freaking out, and the market dropped uh, significantly. Uh, but you'll notice that there was a lot of buying pressure behind that. Seems as though the fear was somewhat short-lived. Let's zoom in here a little bit. Beautiful little doji candle here or a pin bar, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but that shows a lot of indecision. Uh, obviously, if you were watching the markets like we were in the morning, it was bright red, uh, you know, going into, you know, lunchtime. And then after that, just the buying pressure came back in, pushed this thing back up almost to break even on the day. And then look at Friday. We made a new all-time high. New all-time high on the S&P 500 is 4371.60. Uh, so really, really strong recovery uh, from the S&P 500. Shows that, you know, there's a lot of strength still in the market. It still has room to go. But you will notice here on the RSI that we are getting pretty close to that overbought area. Now, if you've taken the masterclass, and I hope that uh, if you're here in Riz Elite, you have, and if you haven't, uh, definitely something to take advantage of when maybe Riz has a sale or something like that. Definitely jump on that masterclass. Uh, but one of the things that he'll talk about with R RSI, which is the Relative Strength Index, is that you know if things can stay overbought for some time or oversold for that matter. It is not a guarantee. There is no indicator that is a guarantee, but it is something that we look at. And obviously, the markets are starting to get into that overbought territory here with the RSI sitting at the end of the day at uh, looks like 67. So pretty darn close to that 70 area, which is the area where we start considering the market being overbought, which if you're an elite uh, following our trades fairly closely, then you'll notice that we haven't been placing a lot of you know, long trades right now. Um, we've been very careful and very selective with our long plays. And the main reason for that is you're really kind of buying it at the highs and that's incredibly dangerous. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Obviously you can make money doing that, don't get me wrong, but it also could leave you holding the bag. And I'll show you a pretty good example of that here in a minute. But uh, we have been very, very cautious with the plays that we're taking because we want to make sure that we have good setups, that they're good plays and good solid companies to make sure that if things do pull back, we are in a good fundamentally sound company that we don't mind holding for long term. That being said, I don't think that a, a healthy uh, you know, pullback is out of order here. I'm not saying that it's going to happen. I'm not saying you know that I know something that you don't. But... When you start seeing this, you know, this huge push like that, it's not uncommon to have a bit of a sell off kind of here towards what we saw in the middle of June or even in here in May. These pullbacks are natural, they're normal and they're healthy, not something that we should freak out about. And uh, I remember, you know, on Thursday in the room, we were talking about it and it was just like, OK, guys, this is the time where you need to just batten down the hatches, hold on tight. And we were definitely rewarded for that on Friday. Let's take a look here at the breakdown for the different market sectors and see what's going on. Energy is starting to pull back a little bit, you know, off from the highest year round, up for positive 47% on the year, now sitting around 39. So almost a 10% drop there over the last couple of weeks. So definitely a bit of a pullback in the energy sector, while real estate just keeps on trucking up at 29.76. Financial saw a big jump on Friday, pushing up to 26.24. The S&P 500 is right there next to tech, but tech has started the rally. Uh, you know, tech has been somewhat underperforming this year, but uh, we're definitely starting to see that push now that we're so used to from tech actually now above the S&P 500 so far in the year, up 18.22%, while the S&P 500 is sitting at 18.09%. 
We're looking really solid so far on the year, guys. Uh, very, very pleased with the performance in the market. Everybody's been crying doom and gloom, market crash, this, that, and the other, and the S&P 500 just keeps on trucking. Uh, healthcare and utilities still underperforming, uh, really not looking all that spectacular. Healthcare up oh, just a paltry 13.95%. I would not mind gains like that in my account. And utilities sitting just below 6% at 5.69% on the year. So all of the market sectors are up above the zero line. So you know everything is doing very, very well so far. Just some sectors are doing a little bit better than others. Want to take a look here at our commodities that we keep an eye on, primarily the black gold and the shiny gold. Uh, so let's look at oil here first making a very strong push and i'm sure some of you are seeing that reflected in the price that you are paying at the pump lately i know that things here in indiana are about 330 a gallon right now i know that in other parts of the world uh it's considerably more expensive i'm not complaining just using it as a price point uh to give you some idea of what we're paying here in the midwest but it had been right around three for quite some time and we had this nice push here up almost to 77 uh, looks like actually no, uh, yeah, we just barely missed it. We had that resistance there at 77. I put it on there with the uh, the line just to give you a visual representation. Uh, pulled back a bit and then on Thursday and Friday, a nice little bit of rally here in oil closing. It looks like on Friday at 74.56 per barrel for light crude. Uh, so oil, of course, we are in the summer season. Uh, 289 in Oklahoma. I wish I was in Oklahoma right now. I'll tell you that. Um, heading into the summer season, not too surprising that we are seeing this push in gold. Lots of different, or excuse me, the black gold, that is, uh, and oil. Uh, lots of travel opening back up. I know a lot of European company countries, excuse me, are opening back up to travelers and tourists, and that's obviously good. Uh, you know, a good step in the right direction, getting back towards normal. So with that, we will see increased oil prices as those jets do not work on electric engines. Taking a look at the shiny gold now, we had a really strong push here after this double bottom formation that we saw here ending in around the end of March. Really solid push here up towards this area here in uh, around 19.20 per dollars per ounce on gold. Then we had a nice pullback here to support right around 17.65, and we've kind of double bottomed there again. We'll have to see, but seeing a nice rebound here off of gold, pushing up to right around 18.0790 per ounce. So gold still, in our opinion, pretty overpriced. Uh, at this point, we're not looking to get into gold or haven't played oil at all this year, uh, which is strange for Riz. If you know Riz from his earlier days, I could have swore we we're playing oil all the time in Elite, but not so much lately. Uh, and definitely not really any, uh, you know, gold plays that we've been looking at so far. I mentioned talking about holding the bag. Let's talk about holding the bag by looking at Bitcoin. I always like Coinbase. So, you know, this is one of those things where you buy something that's overbought and you just kind of get stuck. So, you know, you got plenty of people who are buying Bitcoin here up in the 60s. They aren't feeling too happy right now. Uh, you know, Bitcoin has really found support here right around 32,000. Uh, that definitely has been an area that has been holding pretty solid for it. But uh, still in, uh, you know, after this dump here, we have not recovered. We have not been able to push back over the 50 moving average. Though I will say the moving averages are a little less important with crypto. Uh, than they are, say, with the S&P 500 and other securities. But, uh, you know, a little bit of a refresh there. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, it's because we started up a new candle here. Uh, but, yeah, uh, you know, crypto really just kind of hanging tight right now, right around this 33,000, 33,500 uh, area. Uh, and we'll have to see where it goes from here. But, yeah, really just been kind of consolidating below this line. I had to readjust it a little bit, but, you know, holding pretty steady there. Let me see here. We can't fiddle with this line a little bit. Yeah, that looks pretty tight right there. That looks nice. Uh, so, yeah, Bitcoin not making too many moves lately other than towards the downside. Though, looks like 32 is a very, very strong buying area for Bitcoin at this point. So, uh, you know, could be a place to enter if that's your thing. We aren't trading crypto currently in uh, Riz Elite, but if that is your bag, that is definitely something that you can do. Uh, okay, I have some trades here from Riz, the things that we are going to keep an eye on this week. The first one is going to be Zillow. All right, so 
Uh, Zillow, a, if you're familiar, if you tried selling your house before, it is a, a real estate website. And, uh, you know, taking a pretty big hit here since about February, really getting smashed down, even though it looks like earnings were uh, a beat. I guess uh, the outlook uh, or, you know, the the guidance rather was not so hot if I had to look at it. And even here, it looks like we beat again on earnings. But, yeah, still not seeing a push there on Zillow. A bit of a rejection of the 200 moving average here, but definitely looking like it might be setting up to make a push here. If we have found support here around this 112 area, could be a good air place to possibly get in. If we definitely see a nice push over the 50, that's something that we could potentially look to get into this week. Now, I do want to reiterate, uh, we are not in uh, you know, in Elite, we are not in Zillow currently, but it is something that is on our watch list for this week, something that might make a move that we could potentially capitalize. Next one we got is Disney. A nice little bump here. Obviously, the uh, the new release of the, uh, the Black Widow movie doing some work here on Disney and Marvel, of course. Uh, maybe the uh, obviously the parks reopening, things of that nature will be very good for Disney, uh, which has been suffering, of course, financially since COVID had hit. Uh, but uh, you know, we've got some new releases. We had the uh, what was it? Luca was the new one that came out on Disney Plus. And of course, the new Black Widow movie coming out. Definitely good things for Disney, which of course owns Marvel, if you're not familiar with that. Uh, but uh, definitely, if we can get those parks reopened and things like that, and they start getting more visitors, that will be another good positive catalyst. But really strong move here on Disney over the last couple of days, looking very, very solid, looking to possibly break out. I mean, if we can push here over this 179 area, could definitely be in a nice breakout zone for Disney. So keep an eye on this one for your watch list this week. Name and tech you should be incredibly familiar with would be AMD Advanced Micro Devices. Uh, I am running an AMD processor in the computer that I'm talking to you through right now, so I'm pretty familiar with this. Nice bounce here off of support after we hit, uh, you know, we were approaching all time highs, which we hit back here. Uh, looks like in January, we're making that push and a really strong selling pressure down here. This 95 area is, you know, giving some really solid resistance on AMD, but nice little bounce off support here at 87.20 and looking to potentially push higher. Even with Friday, a lot of selling at the beginning. We closed green on AMD. This one looking definitely poised to make a push towards the upside. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. And then one extra one for you. I know we usually do three. Uh, this is another tech company you should be familiar with. Now, just as a reminder, Riz is long in this. We are long in Elite. Uh, I'm long in my personal account as well. But if you are not, if you missed the alert on that, this could be a good time for you to jump in on Intel. Now, of course, we do see that earnings are coming up here in June, uh, which is, or excuse me, on the 22nd of July, the period ending in June. I'm my uh, misread there, my apologies, uh, but definitely could be a place to go ahead and get in. Of course, Intel, incredibly fundamentally sound, really rock solid chip company. Uh, of course, the somewhat antithesis of AMD, uh, but uh, really nice push back over the 200 simple moving average here, which of course, as we've talked about, is a big area for support and resistance. This bullish move here on Friday would suggest that maybe we may start pushing more towards the north. I would be very happy with that. My portfolio would too. But if you're looking to possibly get in on Intel, uh, this might be a good spot depending on how the markets behave on Monday. Now let's go ahead and take a look here at the trades that we took here over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I will go ahead and go back to the um, before the fourth. All right, here we go. So, uh, da -da 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 -da. okay, you, that's a good one. All right, Unity Software got in on this one at 105.99, looking spectacular. I see a lot of you here in Elite did go ahead and take that one. We got in on this one on the 6th. Uh, so we have been holding this one for a couple days. I uh, did see a bit of a downturn, but now we're back up on the green side of this, looking very nice off this bounce here with the, the 50 and the 90 sitting right there. That little gray line is the 200 because uh, U is a rather new IPO. Uh, but definitely a beautiful technical pattern here. So hopefully we can see this rebound uh, continue on you. Looking very, very nice so far. And then coin. 
Really solid technical play here, and Riz mentioned that in his alert. So there's your technical thesis right there. About as clear as you can see. Beautiful bounce here off of ascending support. Uh, looking to capitalize on this as it moves north. We got in at 248, so looking really solid here. We're up over $5 a share on this right now, looking really good. 257 is profit target number one. Uh, this one could go, you know, a lot higher. Now, of course, Coinbase, what I was looking at the price of Bitcoin off of earlier, uh, but uh, it is an online trading, or excuse me, a crypto trading uh, firm. So, uh, you know, definitely has some popularity going on right now. Uh, crypto is all the rage right now. Though, obviously, as we looked at Bitcoin earlier, definitely cooling off a bit. But uh, coin looking pretty nice here. Technically, if this line holds, we should be, uh, you know, pretty good to keep going. So uh, keep an eye on this one. If you did take it, I do see that some of you did take it, which is awesome. Congratulations to everybody who got in. Currently sitting up $5 plus per share. Wanted to go ahead and open up the floor now to questions. If you guys had things you wanted me to take a look at, uh, now is the time to go ahead and post it in chat. And while you guys are typing uh, your questions or, you know, we talk anything about markets you want to talk about, uh, you know, I do want to just uh, give a little note for everyone here who is not part of Rizalee. Uh, do keep an eye on that. If you're watching the replay on YouTube uh, and you're not in our uh, elite server, definitely keep an eye on that. I've heard rumors that Riz may be opening up uh, applications again. So if you are not in Elite, now would be a good time to keep an eye on the website just as a little heads up. Okay, Matthew says, do I think GIS would be a good play? Let's take a look. General Mills, who needs some cereal? Hmm. This one's looking a little dicey, honestly. Uh, that rejection off the 200 is not too uh, confidence inspiring. I'll say that right now, just looking at the technicals here. Uh, we're definitely, definitely looking a little dicey. I'm, I would not be really comfortable taking it here, mostly off what happened on Friday with the market pushing up so high. And this thing barely moved at all. Uh, now, I will say we are sitting on, you know, ascending support, but resistance is here. We're still below the 200. For me to want to take this, I would want to see it close above this 200 line. Then I'd be less concerned about these, uh, you know, these lines that I've drawn. If it can close above that moving average, I would feel a lot more comfortable taking this one long. Uh, right now, I don't really love it. Uh, it's not something that I would take long right now. So, I mean, if you want to take a starter position, if you feel pretty confident in this, looks like dividends already got paid out at 51 a share. That would have been nice. Uh, earnings looked pretty decent. Uh, I don't know the earnings report for this by heart. I don't know what the, uh, the guidance looked like, but, uh, you know, nice move on earnings day here. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, you know, with the, the the good earnings, that's definitely, you know, a bit more, uh, you know, things to support your thesis of, you know, going long on this one. I personally would want to see it close over the 200 first. Can I speak about early adoption in the market when it comes to new sectors? For instance, 3D printing has been around, but uh, early this year, they had a big run and have obviously since cooled off. Uh, we can take a look at those tickers as well. Typically, we see a bell curve talking about adoption. But what does the market say concerning these new sectors or revived sectors? Okay, so, you know, the thing with uh, early adoption is it, it can definitely be very profitable. So uh, here's 3D systems, obviously a huge run here, uh, starting the year in 2021. Uh, and, you know, had this big push in January, um, early February, kind of cooled off a bit, quite a bit actually, came back to the 200 here in May and has been pushing towards the north side ever since. So, you know, the thing with early adopting is it's definitely a, a speculation, right? So, uh, you know, there are many things that you can get into as far as being an early adopter, but not every one of them is going to turn into Bitcoin or, uh, you know, DDD here, you know, or something along those lines. So it really just depends on what's going on around the world, honestly. So when you're when you're talking about something like that and trying to get into a, you know, an, an early adopter in a sector, you really have to look at kind of 
some of the macros are things that are going on around the world. So, of course, there's macroeconomics, microeconomics, but, you know, macro is more about, you know, things like, oh, I don't know, coronavirus, uh, things like that uh, going on around the world. Hurricane season, of course, you know, is there a hurricane in the Gulf that can affect oil prices? Uh, you know, is there, you know, does OPEC, you know, make a new statement about production or pulling back on production that can affect it. oil. Uh, you know, things with 3D printing, obviously it's a very new technology. It's very promising technology. There's a lot of things that could go well with that. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of 3D printing of about everything you can possibly think of at this point, uh, even to the point of, you know, people thinking that maybe we might be able to 3D print, you know, about anything you can think of uh, lately. Uh, I've heard all different sorts of things from, you know, 3D printed food to, you know, 3D printed organs and skin and things like that. I'll just say I'll believe it when I see it, but, uh, you know, there, there definitely is a lot of, uh, you know, potential there. But that being said, you also have, you know, part of what's going on you can see is like hype. When you look at like the weed sector, uh, you know, Back in, oh gosh, what was it, like 2014, 2015, the weed sector was all the rage. Everybody was jumping in and, you know, it's it's since cooled off, you know, quite a bit. Uh, you know, we had those crazy parabolic moves and then it just kind of pulled back. Uh, so let's go, we can take a look at one of those. Uh, what was the big one? Uh, I got to think, I can't think of it off hand, but I do remember Aurora. So, I mean... Here we go. So I guess my timing was actually, no, I was about right. Uh, so the 2016 area here, uh, 2014, 2015, it was a really slow thing. And of course, if you were an early adopter, yeah, you could do that. Uh, you would have had to been holding for quite some time. Let's say you got an April 2016, you know, probably weren't selling until, you know, well, if you were smart and you held long term, then uh, well over a year. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things that, yeah, has really kind of died off. And it's almost back to where it was pre-hype. So it really just depends kind of on the sector and how the market takes it. Obviously, you know, with marijuana, you know, some states have it legal, some don't. There's still a lot of resistance as far as that's concerned. And so I guess when you're talking about a speculation or a speculative sector and things like that, it really depends on how it plays out long term. And the simple fact of the matter is, is no one knows how that's going to play out. Um, Let's look at this other 3D printing company that you wanted to take a look at. Obviously, I've played this one before. Uh, Proto Labs. All right, let me just clear these lines off. Move drawings, not indicators. So, yeah, uh, you know, kind of similar to Triple D back there, you know, starting uh, in early 2020, nice big push here up into January of this year and definitely a cooling off. So, you know, I think what would really push 3D printing is, you know, what gets adopted and what technology comes out of it. I mean, if you have a line on something that maybe, you know, or you have a friend who works there or something like that, that, you know, maybe there is some new technology coming out. Of course, what I'm describing is insider trading. So please be incredibly careful. Uh, and I would never reckon that you do anything illegal or to use that information to your own personal financial gain. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things, if you have an inkling or just a feeling that, uh, you know, 3D printing is going to, you know, continue to push, then it definitely can be something that you look at long term. But I think when you're talking early adoption, it has to be a long term investment. Uh, you know, if you were an earlier adopter of Bitcoin, you were holding for quite some time while that thing was trading for, you know, 50 to to $100 per coin before it went nuts. Uh, so, and then there's the thing when you can just get in on an early adoption on something and it just goes nowhere uh, and the money is basically forfeit. So I'm not going to call it a coin flip, but it really kind of just depends on the sector and what the future outlook looks for it. Now, I'll say for 3D printing, I think there's a lot of potential in the sector. I think there's a lot of things, there's a lot of technologies that they're working on as far as some of these more advanced 3D printers, not some of the garbage that you can buy for your own personal use, but uh, like some of the good ones, uh, they can do some really crazy stuff with that. Uh, and so I think there's definitely potential there, but I think it's going to take some time for it to really you know, come to fruition. So if you're cool holding long term on something like 3D printing, then I think that it could definitely be a solid investment for you long term. 
Are you going to see like swing trade gains and things like that? Maybe, maybe not. But if you're an early, uh, you know, uh, adopter and you're looking for it long term, it can definitely be incredibly profitable for you. But, you know, again, it's one of those things where you don't want to get stuck holding the bag, because if you did that on weed, thinking that it was just going to keep going up and up and up and up, then you're going to be pretty disappointed today. So I would say you still want to be agile as far as that's concerned. Make sure you're locking in your gains if you're an early adopter. But if you are an early adopter, uh, only risk what you're willing to potentially lose, because if the sector doesn't, you know, take off, if you don't see any, uh, you know, if there is no forward outlook for it, then that money is basically forfeit. So just be careful. Uh, don't go all in on one sector, but it is definitely something that you can do. Uh, just like I said, just be prepared to hold, uh, because if you're willing to do that, more than likely you'll you'll come out on top if there is a good outlook for the sector. Hey, Jacob, good to see you. Glad you're here. Hey, no, don't worry. You're here. That's all that matter. Uh, I have not talked about CCXI yet. All right, let's take a look at it. Okay, so CCXI, the black swan event that put Riz long on this one, uh, definitely, you know, got wrecked uh, here on, uh, you know, this this drop here. But yeah, looking pretty strong uh, over the last couple days. Uh, I will say that is a very nice move on Thursday and Friday. Even with Thursday, with the market being down, uh, CCXI is making a nice push here with a bit of volume. So looking pretty solid. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate that. And yeah, it, it's just one of those things where uh, you just have to be willing to sell it. I think you don't want to hold the bag indefinitely. Take your profits if you're an early adopter and be looking for opportunities to get back in. Uh, but yeah, back to CCXI, uh, definitely a very strong bullish move here. Uh, if you did get stuck in that short put and you got uh, assigned for CCXI, um, you know, that sucked, obviously, but starting to look better. Uh, you know, we are getting some nice moves here. Look like, like I said, looks like volume starting to come back in down here. So that's a really good thing to see. Uh, we were oversold. And this is, this is a great example of what I was talking about where uh, for RSI, right? Uh, look down here on this, that that is about as perfect an example as I can give you as something being oversold for quite some time. Uh, now, you know, obviously it is starting to come back, which is good if you are holding this one uh, from a short put getting a sign. Uh, if not, uh, you know, definitely looking solid here. Uh, very, very pleased to see this move. This is looking really good. Thoughts on long-term hold on D-Nut? Krispy Kreme, baby. Mm -mm -mm. I remember when they had stores. Gosh, I miss that. I remember going to the Krispy Kreme store. The smell going into that was just, uh, mm, I'm getting good memories for it. Uh, all right. So this is an interesting one, right? So obviously recent IPO, we have literally basically no data uh, is what I'm going to say. This is, we got one, two, three, four, five, six candles. Uh, so really nothing to go off of here um, other than that tasty, tasty, sweet goodness of donuts. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, if if you're good with the company, I don't know. Uh, it does give you a sugar high. You're not wrong, Aaron. Uh, I don't know the fundamentals on this one. Uh, I have not looked into it. If you have and you feel confident in this one, Liam, then you know, go for it. If you like the direction that the company is going and things like that, then, you know, you can definitely go for it. Um, again, they don't have uh, brick and mortar stores anymore. And that can be not necessarily a bad thing, right? You know, so we see, you know, companies that were, you know, so focused on being a brick and mortar store like Blockbuster, right? So Blockbuster got absolutely wrecked by Netflix. Uh, and it still is. I don't think anybody... Uh, well, I won't say anybody, but we'll say not as many members in Elite remember going into a Blockbuster store and renting a game or a video. I do because that was my childhood. But um, and that tells you something my age to an, an extent. Uh, but, you know, Krispy Kreme kind of I think they might have went ahead and, and seen the writing on the wall as far as that's concerned, where especially with the resurgence of, uh, you know, things like Duncan and things like that. Uh, Krispy Kreme really only made donuts. That was the only thing they did. There wasn't a coffee side to it. There wasn't a, 
you know, uh, breakfast sandwiches or other, you know, breakfast accessories or whatever you want to call it, uh, aspect to it. And so perhaps they were actually incredibly smart for going ahead. Their coffee sucks. Okay, good to know. Uh, but, um, you know, perhaps it's one of those things that they kind of saw the writing on the wall and they're like, okay, we can't afford to, you know, refurb our, all of our stores to compete with this growing trend. And so they decided to, you know, close down their brick and mortars and go entirely on delivery. Now, of course, you see Krispy Kreme donuts all over the place around here, especially in gas stations. And with more and more people traveling, that means more and more people are going to be in gas stations. So that definitely bodes well for Krispy Kreme because, oh man, there's nothing like a nice warm Krispy Kreme donut coming off, uh, you know, after you fill up your tank. Uh, but uh Again, if you know the fundamentals of this, if you've looked into it and you're familiar with it and you're happy with the way, the direction the company's going, could be a good time to go ahead and take this one long and hold it, uh, you know. But uh, it is one of those things that, it, again, I don't know the, the fundamentals and I can't give you anything on the technicals right now off of six candles. That's, that's just me just drawing lines uh, and with no other data to back it up, there's not enough for me to say one direction or another. I mean, obviously a nice uh, finding of early support here around 17 and curling towards the upside, closing at 19, almost 1930 on Friday. So, you know, definitely looking nice. You know, you could say, oh, well, Chris, it's in an uptrend like this. Well, yeah, that, that's true. You're right. It is, but it's also in a downtrend here. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things when you only have six candles drawing, you know, support and resistance lines is pretty, pretty useless uh, for lack of a better term. So, Again, it, it comes down to the fundamentals. And if you love the company, if you're fine holding this long term, by all means, go for it. I would say don't get caught holding the bag of donut holes too long. Uh, if it goes against you, uh, it's one of those things you may need to let it go uh, because it's a question of what the uh, what the market feels about it and where their stance is on Krispy Kreme donuts, if they remember walking into those stores or not. Uh, but yeah. How much further can the SPY go? Ben and Matthew, everybody wants to know that question. Uh, everybody wants to know that one. Uh, and if I could tell you how far it was going to go and when it was going to stop, then, uh, you know, we could all be flipping millionaires, right? I mean, like overnight almost. Uh, sadly, uh, no one knows uh, how far it can go. Can it go further? I think yes. Uh, are we expecting inflation to sneak back in? I think in, in, in inflation is going to be a big news story when that those numbers come out. That could definitely affect the behavior of the market that day. The real question is, is are the results already baked into the price is the question. So uh, obviously inflation is a big, big word that's running around right now. Everybody's freaking out because the amount of the money that the Fed is printing uh, and we'll have to see how that affects the market. But as of right now, I'll say it hasn't affected it all that much. Uh, even when those inflation numbers came out and people kind of freaked out, yeah, the market sold for a couple of days, but then it bounced back up. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's one of those questions. If the inflation numbers keep going up, I think we will see a pullback in the market. Uh, if the inflation numbers are not bad, uh, are not as bad as people are expecting, I think we'll see the SPY continue to run, the S&P 500. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's impossible for me to say, Matthew, because no one knows the future. Uh, if I had the magic line that said it's going to go this far and no further, man, we would be buying SPY puts when it got there. But uh, as for now, uh, I can't give you a number or say where it's going to be. Uh, but can it go further? I think, yes, it can. Uh, I think as things start getting back to normal and people have more consumer confidence, I think we'll see more and more people uh, putting their money in the market and letting it run. What do I think about a short play on NVIDIA? Man, we haven't done anything short in a long time. Oh boy, talk about extended. That is a beautiful extended pattern here. Uh, obviously, NVIDIA, a fantastic company. Uh, they have a split announcement, okay. Uh, so if you go short on this, you're you're not guaranteed to make a ton of money once this splits because you'll just be increased uh, on your, your short position, basically. I have, a, I have mixed feelings about shorting this because I know NVIDIA incredibly fundamentally solid. One of the, I, I, mean, I have an NVIDIA, NVIDIA graphics card in my computer. Uh, so, uh, you know, I can't say anything bad about the company. Is this overextended? Yeah. This is way extended. Uh, so 
if you're going to play it short, you keep it on a tight leash. All right, Matthew, because shorting a fundamental company or a strong fundamental company like this, or if we want to look at something else, it's also extended right now, Apple, something like that. Uh, it's not recommended to hold something like that short for long. So if you're going to do it, it help if I could type it right, keep it on a really tight leash. All right. I don't want you to get stuck uh, holding this one short for very long. Is there a possibility for the SPY to drop as much as Bitcoin did? No, I don't think so. Uh, we would take another event like coronavirus for that to happen. It would have to be a worldwide event to have the S&P 500 drop the way that Bitcoin did because Bitcoin is completely unregulated and the S&P 500 is. Even during the corona crash, as I like to call it, we saw multiple circuit breaker stops on the market uh, here during these days back here. Uh, when we had all these massive moves on the S&P 500. This is all coronavirus right here. Uh, this is all fear and, uh, and fear and anticipation. And, you know, at the end of March, it's been nothing but green skies for the market, even though we were going through, uh, you know, the heat of corona, for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, the market just chugged along. Uh, so it would take a massive global event like that uh, for the market to drop. I don't even know at this point if a new conflict that started would uh, spark that off. Even if, you know, China makes a move somewhere or, you know, there's lots of speculation on who's going to move where and who's doing this. Even when troops were building up on the border of Ukraine with Russia, uh, the market didn't really move all that much uh, because most people knew that Russia was basically just saber rattling, uh, which is typical for Putin. But, uh, you know, I, I don't foresee a Bitcoin-esque move in the S&P 500 unless there is a massive catalyst. And I mean massive catalyst. And there are safeguards in place to prevent, you know, huge, huge sell-offs like that. So I don't think we're going to see something like this in the S&P 500. I have a hard time. You have to remember there are no safeguards on Bitcoin. It's straight up Wild West, unregulated, uh, which is, of course, the way it was designed to be. Uh, you know, it is decentralized and you see the the benefits and the, you know, the, the cons uh, for that. I mean, the pros, it can move really big. The cons, people who are influential just tweet things and move Bitcoin, which I think is a load of crap. Uh, but they can, uh, you know, Musk prints, you know, a tweet that he's pulling some of, you know, Tesla's stuff out of Bitcoin and, uh, you know, Bitcoin tanks. He tweets that they're going to start taking Bitcoin as payment for, you know, cars and it, you know, shoots up. Uh, it was no different back in, you know, the Trump era when Trump tweeted something and the market jumped or the market tanked. Uh, so, uh, you know, that being said, it ain't going to go this much. I mean, this is 50% we're looking at here. Uh, let's look here from the highs to support here. Okay, so 50% in 35 days. I'm going to straight up say no, not going to happen on the S&P 500. You will not see the S&P 500 lose 50% of its value in a month and a half. And now, of course, remember that that was actually just a month for Bitcoin because Bitcoin's traded every day of the week. Uh, the S&P 500, of course, is only open on trading days. So for 35 trading days for the market would be about a month and a half. So, yeah, I, I don't think so. Uh, it would take it would take something even worse than coronavirus for that to happen. I, I don't think the Delta variant is it. Uh, you know, Pfizer's already said that they have or they're working on a booster. But even in their own press release, they said that it wasn't really necessary to get the booster. So, uh, you know, I don't think that that's going to happen. I doubt it, Yas. The question is for, so I, I need to reread the questions uh, for the, the YouTube recording because I, I don't have the chat post on there. So the question is, will the spectator ban on the Japanese Olympics uh, have any effect on the market in the coming weeks? I doubt it. Uh, I highly doubt it. I think it'll affect their bottom line uh, as far as, as that's concerned. But, um, you know, because there's nothing that's going to replace people going to buy those, you know, those souvenirs plush toys or uh, all the sodas or things that would be consumed, all the hot dogs, because I'm sure they have a lot of those in Japan. So I guess maybe in Japan we'd have the, the sushi dogs uh, and things of that nature. 
Um, I don't actually know. I've never been to Japan, so I can't comment. It would be cool to go there someday, though. I don't think that it's going to affect the market all that much. Plus, they've already announced it. So if there is going to be any effect, it would already be baked in, uh, in my opinion. So uh, I don't think it's going to affect it hardly at all. And I don't think it's overly uh, surprising, honestly, especially coming from, you know, one of the Asian nations that has always been somewhat, well, let's just say germaphobic. Uh, they're always about wearing the masks and things like that, even before coronavirus. So I'm not surprised that they said that they weren't going to do that. Um, a little disappointed, uh, but not surprised. And I think maybe that will that sentiment will be kind of carried by the market. It's like, yeah, we're not really happy you did that, but we really don't care because it doesn't really affect us. I mean, the only person it would affect were people who actually bought tickets. And, you know, as much as I love our Olympians, I'm not going to be flying to Japan to, to go watch it. Unless my daughter was on the team, I'm not going. And I think that's kind of the, the feeling that a lot of people around the world are going to have, uh, because I think the vast majority of people would be watching it on, on the internet or over, you know, on the TV anyway. So I don't think it'll really affect the market at all. Like I said, I think it will affect Japan's bottom line, but not the S&P 500. Great question, though. And great questions overall tonight. And I uh, definitely want to thank everybody for coming out. It was a great webinar. I think this is a good place to go ahead and call it a night. Uh, thank you, everybody, who came out live for this. I'm so glad that we're back at it. Uh, it was definitely a great discussion tonight, great topics. And uh, really appreciate everybody showing up tonight. Of course, uh, as always, guys, we will see you in Discord on Monday. Back for a full trading week. Have a great rest of your weekend, everybody. Good night.